we start a new series, and I'm excited about that. If you have not met me, my name is Chuck. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am having the privilege to start this new series that we are calling This is Church. See, here at Life, we love church. We see it as not just an organization, but an organism that God designed for his glory in this age for us to make disciples through. So in, sh in this short series, our desire is to look at what God has done and, and look how had God has designed certain facets of the church, which will provide us a right understanding of ecclesiology, which is the study of the church. And since God has designed his church, it is very important that we function according to his design. Now, ecclesiology helps us to understand the role of the church and our role in the church. It teaches us about the ordinances of the church, baptism and communion, how church leadership is to be chosen and structured, what the church should be doing in regards to believers, specifically how it is that we are to worship and grow in disciples. It also shows us how we are to interact with unbelievers, those to whom we evangelize to, our mission field. So if we are to function as a church according to Scripture, then at the very least, it's important to know our specific role within that church. So today and over the next two Sundays, our desire is to continue to grow in clarity about the church as well as our clarity about God's design for the church. And we will be looking at three different facets. Church membership, church leadership, and church discipleship. Now, before we start with our topic today of church membership, I think it's best that we briefly review the church as an institution established by God, not man. That must be clear. The Bible teaches us that God established three primary institutions for his creation. The family, we see this in Genesis chapter 2, where God joined Adam and Eve together in marriage. And in verse 24, it says, Therefore man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. That's the institution of marriage, the family. Then we see in Genesis chapter 9, after Noah and his family get off of the ark and God makes a covenant with him and he blesses Noah and his sons, he gives, him, he gives them the heavy responsibility of capital punishment. He tells them this in Genesis verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man's blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. That is the government. And then we see the church. This is found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. But prior to, Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, to which Jesus rep replies to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Praise the Lord. That is God instituting the church. And since God establishes these three institutions, the family, the government, and the church, which are intended for our use and for his glory, we are obligated to follow his design in them. I tell people all the time, when I joined the Marine Corps, I didn't sign the dotted line and say, okay, now I'm going to do it my way. No, I adhered to the institution that was created. Same way with God's institution. So when we are looking at God's design for the church, its birth, we see at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And from there on, we are provided with distinctive marks that makes a church a church. Now, this is important for us to note because there are a lot of well-meaning organizations that are for the advancement of the gospel and God's kingdom expansion. But they're not a church. What makes a church a church are just some identifying marks that we see throughout Scripture. A true church has faithful preaching of God's word, 
faithful administration of the ordinances, baptism and communion, and faithful exercise of discipline. Now, the church has many more distinctive marks that we can name, such as prayer, the gathering of fellowship, sharing of possessions, and so on. But these three marks are easily observable. Faithfully preaching God's word, administering the ordinances, and exercising discipline are visible and recognizable marks that are found within a local church that we also see all throughout Scripture. And here's the best part. These marks are visibly recognized when they are provided and received by the members in that church. So this is how we identify those who are part of the invisible church or the universal church Those through whom God has elected and all of those whom God has saved through saving faith. The members of the local church officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Christ. And his kingdom is um, uh, gone through the preaching of God's word and the gospel cooperation of all the members within it. So these marks are crucial to our understanding of what a church is. So from the birth of the church, we see this official affirmation of those in the universal church being recognized by the local members within that church as they provide and receive faithful preaching, faithful administration of the ordinances, and faithful exercise of discipline. Now, some of the terminology people may object to. That's completely fine. But the distinctives are real and they're important. So... The universal church can be found within the visible church. That's the big point that I'm trying to make. There are those that are saved by grace through faith that are a part of the universal church, but they are affirmed and recognized within the local church, which is the visible church. So this is why church membership is so vital. This is why church membership is so important. And how we understand this is through God's word. So my hope and my prayer in the next 25 to 30 minutes is to unpack God's design for membership in his church and how it impacts all of our roles within the church. So I ask that you open your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We will be in verses 12 through 14. Now here at Life... We value God's word. We value preaching and teaching out of God's word. So we encourage you, if you do not have a Bible, we want to give you a Bible. Because we are encouraging everyone to be a Berean. The Bereans were those who eagerly received the word. But they also searched the scriptures daily to see whether that which was preached was true to God's word. So we want to encourage you to be a Berean. If you do not have a Bible, please, after the service, go to our Connect team. They will be glad to gift you a Bible for free. So before we jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, we we notice, you probably notice that we're starting in the middle of this chapter and pretty much towards the end of this book. So let me provide just a little bit of context before we read the text together. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to a local church that was in Corinth specifically to exhort and admonish them because Chloe's people told Paul that there were some things going on in the church that he needed to address. Now, the people in Corinth valued impressive speakers, status, greed, immoral sex, and idolatry. It is likely that these members in Corinth grew up in this pagan context. And since they had only recently become Christians, it is not surprising that to some degree they were embracing Corinth's worldly values. So the Apostle Paul addresses at least 10 issues found in this book by calling out and pointing them back to the gospel. If we were to sum up the book of, or if we were to sum up the lessons that are found in every single chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, it would be this. The gospel results in God's holy people maturing in purity and unity, which is expressed in every single chapter. 
Because every single chapter we see an issue, and the Apostle Paul addresses it with the gospel for their purity and for their unity. So when we jump into chapter 12, we see Paul calling out their sin of prioritizing spiritual gifts and failing to use the gifts for the building up of the church and the edification of the saints. But the gospel solution that Paul points to is to pursue love through the union of Christ. So that way their gifts can be used for the building up of the church and the edification of the saints. And he does this by way of analogy that is found in our text today. So look at verse 12 with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, For even as the body is one, yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For also by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For also the body is not one member, but many. Here the Apostle Paul is pointing out this unnecessary division that they were making because of the disputes that they were having. But the fact that they are one escape their notice. So the Apostle Paul is showing them that it's because of their union in Christ that they should not be dividing. They are one body, although they are many. So the big truth that we see just from these few verses that helps us to understand our roles as members in the church is this. Church membership represents our unity in Christ. This is the big truth that I want you to get today. If you don't get anything else, write this down. Church membership represents our unity in Christ. Now, it is important for us to have a right understanding of this because a wrong understanding will leave Chloe's people to get at you and, and tell Paul. Just play it. Just play it. That's, they're, not, they're not here. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think they're here. But no, it's, it's more serious than that. A wrong view of church membership will only lead to division within the body of Christ. Amen. Listen, we don't want division in the body of Christ. And unfortunately, I, I speak this from experience. Early on in my life, my, my walk with the Lord, uh, I had a distorted view of church membership because I made some false assumptions that I should not have had in the very beginning. When I was in college, me and Janae were in, uh, engaged, and we, were no, we, we knew that it was important to get more serious about our faith. So we said, well, we need to be into a church. So we started to look for a church in rural Iowa. We started looking, and by God's grace, we found a church that was about you know, 30 to 50 people. It was a nice, small church. We felt very warm, and we felt welcome, and we seemed to like it. The pastor faithfully preached God's word. They faithfully baptized and took communion. Uh, we even had the opportunity to sit down with the pastor after the service, to which we even expressed that we might want to join this church. Listen, we left that Sunday feeling good. And then next Sunday, the pastor gets up, he opens up his Bible, and he says, Today, I want to talk to you about membership. How is it important to be a part of a local church? Now, again, this is rural Iowa. There's about maybe 30 to 50 people in here. So in my mind, everybody else is already a member. The only reason that came in my mind that he would be talking about church membership was to guilt me and Janae into becoming members. So in my arrogance, I turned to Janae and I said, I wonder what he would be preaching if we weren't here. And she said, I don't know. So I grabbed her hand, we got up, we walked out, and we didn't look back. The sad part is I remained divided from a local body for years, all because of my false assumption. I separated myself from the people that God intended for me to be united with. It wasn't until years later that I learned 
Church membership represents our unity in Christ. So whether you are in the church search process, you are a guest here at Life, a regular tender, or even a member, it is vitally important for us to understand how church membership represents our unity in Christ so that we can function properly in the body of Christ. So how does church membership represent our unity in Christ? I believe Paul actually answers this question in these three verses. He, 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 he shows just this progression that I want to pull out before you. So we'll do it like this. Unity in Christ is represented through membership because conversion joins us to his body. Look back at what it says in verse 12. For even as the body is one, yet has many members, all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Here, Paul is making the connection of those who have been saved that they are grafted in to one body. They are no longer lone wolves that go at life by themselves. They have been transformed into coexisting sheep that belong in the flock. And this is the miracle that takes place at conversion. And yes, it is a miracle because when we look at Ephesians 2, it rightly states that you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the rulers of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all also formerly conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh and the desires of our flesh and of our mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God... But God, in his rich mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace that you are saved. It is by grace. This is the miracle. He transformed a dead person and made them alive. That is nothing short of a miracle. You know why? Because dead men don't act. Now, contrary to what some might believe, the conversion from death to life doesn't stop there. It's not as though God saves us, joins us to his body, pats us on the butt and say, you got it. That's not it. Those who believe this or even worse, live in this way, don't find the rest or the peace that God intended from the very first place. They don't find that. Not only does he do the work of a miracle to bring a dead man to life, he also becomes our peace by joining us to his body. Ephesians chapter, four, uh, chapter 2 verses 14 and 16 says this, For he himself is our peace who made both groups one and broke down the dividing wall partition by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinance. Why? So that he himself might create two into one new man, making peace. That he might reconcile them both into one body in God through the cross, having himself put to death the enmity. God saves us. He joins us, and then he continues on with us. It is not as though he just leaves us to be on ourselves. So not only does God join us and saves us, and he puts us into a, a, a body of believers, but he, he says that he makes us one as he is one. And listen, this, this is the part that gets me every time. Because early on, when I was reading through the Bible, the question that I had was, how does this apply to me? I see what Jesus did with his disciples. I see what Jesus has done on his time on earth. But how does this apply to me personally? And then I read John chapter 17. Oh, man. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays to the Father. This is right before his crucifixion. He prays to the Father, 
And then he prays for his disciples that are with him. And then in verse 20, his prayer shifts just a little bit. He says, I do not ask on behalf of those of these alone, but for those who would believe in my name through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Amen. He even thought of me before he went to the cross. Amen. He prayed for me that I would believe the word that someone would preach and be saved and have eternal life. Not only did he reveal himself, but he makes it personal. This is why faithful preaching of God's word is a true mark of a church. It is through the faithful preaching of the word that one hears and calls on the name of the Lord. And at the point of conversion, not only are you saved by grace, through his, through, uh, you're not only are you saved by grace, but you are also joined to his body and you become a member of the universal church. You have a whole family that is together with us. And it gets better. Unity in Christ is represented through our membership because conversion joins us to his body. But we also see that citizenship identifies us with his kingdom. Look at what it says in verse 13. For also by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. Now, here Paul is re remaining consistent with his point. He further clarifies that all of those who have been converted are now cleansed. Well, well, they were cleansed and empowered by the Holy Spirit who indwells them at the point of conversion. So listen, this refutes any idea that baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second work or that it is evident solely by speaking in tongues. You are baptized with the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion. Because he says this word all, which is, which is decisive. He says for all were baptized and we were all made to drink of the same spirit. So actually this highlights the universal nature that all believers experience at the point of conversion. And its role is to identify them as members, individual members and collective members in the body of Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, which unites us to Christ and his body, also shows a legal change of our citizenship. When Paul says, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, he is pointing out, he is pointing out identifying marks that use to define them which no longer is the case because they all have a new identity in Christ. Listen, when I sit down with a new believer or when I'm presenting the gospel with someone, I make sure that this is a crucial point that I explain. I make sure that this is a fact that they know to be true through the scriptures because we are defined by our identity. Prior to Christ, one's identity is found in what you do for a living, where you're from, how you feel, and so on. But when one places saving faith in Jesus Christ, you are no longer identifying what you used to be identified by. That no longer defines you. You have a new identity. All believers have a new identity. So praise God for the job that you got, but it doesn't define you. Praise the Lord that you were able to do all of these things and be recognized for it. But that does not define you. Yes, you were fearfully and wonderfully made, the male or female that you are today by God. But that doesn't define you. Hallelujah. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. But listen, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you are. this is not your home. 
You have a new citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. We need to understand that. We have a new identity, which is affirmed through the local church. Because we live in this already not yet time frame, the local church serves as an embassy until the consummation of his kingdom. Viewing the local church as an embassy provides the clarity to, that helps us understand that this is an institution that is representing one nation, God's kingdom, inside of another nation, the world that we live in. It declares the home nation's intentions to the host nation, and it protects the citizens while they are living in the host nation. Listen, this is our embassy. This is, this is an area to where we are walking on behalf of God, and it shows that the mission of God starts here, and it goes out into the world. So church membership is important. Because the local church affirms the declaration of its members' citizenship in the kingdom. And two visible ways that this is affirmed is baptism and communion. At the point of conversion, the baptism of the Holy Spirit identifies one into the body of Christ. That's done. So water baptism does not save you. It is a public proclamation that, has, that, that shows that this has already occurred. It is the symbol of us being buried with him in his death and being raised to the newness of life that we proclaim in front of the assembly. Same goes for communion. It doesn't save you either. The local church affirms those who partake because of the seriousness that it stresses. Earlier in chapter 12 of 1 of Corinthians, chapter, uh, uh, earlier in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, we see Paul is calling out those who are abusing the Lord's Supper. He reminds them that Jesus gave his body and his blood for the church. And this is to be done in remembrance of him. So do not despise it, nor eat or drink in an unworthy manner. Rather, test yourself, judge yourself rightly to, so that you are not judged. This is why seeing the church as an embassy provides a clearer perspective for us walking as the people of God. Our embassy affirms that which is already true about us. Members in a local church have the authority to affirm one's unity in Christ not granted. So unity in Christ is represented through membership because our conversion joins us to his body. Citizenship identifies us with his kingdom. And lastly, we see cooperation unites us for his purposes. In this final verse, Paul says, for also the body is not one member, but many. Here, Paul stresses the importance of the diversity that is within each member of the body. We must remember that Paul's gospel solution for the church in Corinth was to pursue love through unity, earnestly desiring and using their gifts for the building up of the church and the edification of the saints. That is his point. The gifts that the Spirit has given us are not to be used for ourselves. They are to be used to build up the church and to edify the saints. So we should be those who give ourselves to the church publicly, physically, socially, affectionately, financially, vocationally, ethnically, uh, ethically, and spiritually, and any other lead that you can think of. We are to give ourselves, our entire bodies, to the church because it is that which builds up and edifies. Amen. That is the purpose of our gifts. Paul's point is that each person of the body, though an important individual, needs to be functioning well as a healthy member of the body in order so that the body would function correctly. 
So each part of the body has a role, and none is more important than the other. But this doesn't happen when we view church like we view Sam's Club. It doesn't happen. Like, listen, if, and this is not a knock on Sam's Club. I like Sam's Club. I got a membership of Sam's Club, okay? But if I were to view church like I would view Sam's Club, it would be like this. I go when I need something. Preferably, I'll get it in bulk so I don't have to come, you know, as often. My plan is to get in and get out, hoping that the preaching, I mean, the lines are not too long. (laughs) I probably won't engage in any relationships with any of the people. Well, I might just talk to the lady that at the, uh, when I leave, because she always has to talk to me for some reason. So I might engage with her. But outside of that, I probably won't engage in any other type of relationship. I pay my dues maybe once a month or, you know what, better, once a year so that way I don't have to worry about it all that much. When I get bored or I want something new, I just go to Costco and get a membership. (laughs) Beloved, this is not how we need to view the local church. The local church is the authority on earth that Jesus installed to officially affirm and give shape to the lives of every Christian. The life and the authority of the local church shapes and orients the lives of every one of its members. So this might shock you, but Christians don't join churches. They submit to them. This is why faithful exercise of discipline serves as a mark of a true church. The church in Corinth was failing in this area. Paul needed to correct them several times. But the purpose of discipline was not to tear them down. I need to say this again. The purpose of discipline is not to tear down. The purpose of discipline serves to expose, warn, save, protect, and present a good witness for Jesus, which ultimately shapes and orients the lives of all those who are members, which is the purpose that God intended for the first place. Love. Love for the individual. Love for the church. Love for the watching world. And love for Christ as we grow in purity and in unity. And sadly, it is too common for churches, I mean, it is too common for Christians to hop church to church, never submitting themselves to the loving oversight of pastors or never committing themselves to a group of fellow believers. And this might be due to the word submit. It scares some people. And I get it. There has been leaders that have abused the leadership that has been entrusted to them over and over even within the church. But listen, God's design for the leaders in the church was meant for their good. It was meant for their good. Listen, I've heard the stories of pastors and, and, and leaders using Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, saying, you need to obey me. You need to submit to me. But this is why when we read scripture, we need to read it with the authorial intent, how the author intended for this to be communicated. And when you read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it, it, it puts a heavy weight on those that are leaders within the church. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who would give an account so that they would do this with joy and not with groaning, for this would be unprofitable for you. Myself, Pastor Andrew, Pastor Matt, and Pastor Jason will give an account for all of those who God has entrusted to us here at Life. We take that very seriously. And when we interact with members that are obeying and submitting to us for the building up of the church and their edification, for their discipleship. It brings us so much joy. 
Because that is how God intended leadership to be. So for anyone to neglect or to refuse to submit to a local church only reveals a misunderstanding of the believer's responsibility within the body. And it hinders them from the many blessings and opportunities that flow from this type of commitment. When Paul addresses the issues in the church, he rightly calls them out. But he also points them back to Jesus. Because church membership represents our unity in Christ. Conversion joins us to his body. Citizenship identifies us with his kingdom. And cooperation unites us for his purposes. Listen, at Life, we value membership. We view membership as a mutual relationship between us, the church, and the Christian. It is characterized by our oversight and the Christian's discipleship as the Christian submits to the leadership of the church and the church lives out their God-given calling for that leadership, for the members. We are committed to faithfully preach the word of God. We faithfully observe baptism and communion. And we faithfully exercise discipline. And no one is exempt. We don't do this because we want some type of authority. We do this because God has entrusted to us a people that we are giving an account to. And as members of the body, we want to cooperate with one another. We want to love one another. We, it is the only way that we are able to live out all of the one another's if we are in a committed relationship together. So this is why we do Intro to Life. Because we want you to make a well-informed decision to see if this is the local church for you. And listen, if this is not the local church for you, that is fine. You are still a part of the body if you're a believer. We want you to get plugged in and get committed to a local church. Let us help you find that. Because listen, us wanting you to be a member here at Life is not because we want something from you. No. What we see in Scripture is that you being a member benefits you for your discipleship. It builds up the church, and it edifies the saints. So we don't want nothing from you. We want something for you. Amen. So every second Sunday of the month, we host what's called Intro to Life. It's an opportunity for you to know more about us, for you to know more about the doctrines that we believe, for you to go deeper in an understanding of how it is that we do church. You're able to ask questions that you would have if you're coming from a different church or if you have questions about how we um, um, do certain things here. It, it is a wonderful opportunity for you to be on that path towards membership. Whether you're a guest, whether you are a regular tender, whether you're searching for a church. And listen, we've even had members come and they see and get to express the love that they have for being a part of a local church. So I want to invite you, if you have yet to attend an intro to life, if you desire to be a, a, a member of this local body, I would love for you to come next Sunday during the 1045 service. We will host the intro to life in the, community, in the uh, community center right across from us. I would love to talk to you more about what it is, that, uh, what it is about your role in this body. Because one of my roles that I'm privileged to have outside of being a pastor is to connect people and to care for people. I, I view my role as this. I, I want to help guests experience life. I want to help regular attenders engage in the rhythms of life. And I want to equip the members for the work of the ministry. Because church membership 
represents our unity in Christ. And I can't do this alone. So let me end with three quick learning to lives for you. Here at Life, we don't want you to just hear a message theologically and be filled up with all this knowledge and walk out and never apply it. We want you to apply the word that has been preached so that way you do not leave here the same way you came in. So I have three questions, and this is for you, not your neighbor, not the person that you've been thinking about this entire time. This is for you. Question number one, am I joined to Christ's body? Before you can even think about joining a local church, you need to be joined to the body of Christ, the universal church. And the beauty is that in this is when you hear the gospel and you receive, you hope and you trust in Jesus and him alone by placing your faith in him, you are saved. And at the point of conversion, you are a part of the universal church. And that is affirmed through the local church. So have you received the message that is preached? Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that he is Lord, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty that you rightfully deserve? But then when he rose from the dead, he offers you eternal life that you would be saved. Are you joined to Christ's body? Question number two, what is my relationship to others in the body? Listen, there are many members of the body, and yes, the body is one, but there are a lot of members within the body. What is your relationship to it? Is your relationship just with the universal church? Is your relationship to where you have a group of believers that you are committed to within a local church? Are you using the gifts that God has given you for the building up of the church and the edification of the saints? Or are you using your gifts selfishly? What is your relationship to those members that we affirm and recognize? And then question number three. How is my effectiveness a part of the body? The cooperation that we have within the body is to advance the gospel. We need to be those that are equipped for the work of the ministry. That equipping happens within a local church that disciples us well and that sends us on mission. Sunday morning is the gathering of all the believers. And after that service, we scatter because we are on mission to proclaim the gospel to all of those who would hear. Are you effective in that mission? Listen, church, I love you. My desire is that all of you are members here at Life. But my biggest desire is that you are a member of the body of Christ. Because church membership represents our unity in Christ more so than anything else. Let's pray.